Welcome to our first episode of For Real. We're joined today by Lois Marcel, our head coach. Okay, so Lois, I am um, I've Googled you. Oh wow. <laughs> That's a Google, my career. Well, okay. no, I just thought I'd get the facts right. Okay. It's always about the facts, isn't it? So Hunslet Hawks, is that your first like girls team you joined? First girls team, yeah. Yeah. And then followed by Bradford Bulls. Yep. Um, 18 caps for England, debuting at 2009. Yeah. Wow, I was young then. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, how old were you? Like, I don't know, seven. <laughs> I was seven, eight. I was 17. Oh, six then. <laughs> um, and then Lee Joyner's first ever captain. Yeah. How good is that? It's not bad. <laughs> Nominated for Woman of Steel. Yeah, lost it though. That <laughs> dumb dog. <Jurati. laughs> it's all right. Um, development officer at Lee Joyner's. Yeah. How many years have you been doing that? Too many now, I'm joking. Um, maybe 10. Okay. 10. Um, first RFL Women's Ambassador. Mm-hmm. 2020, appointed Lee Dwyer's Women Head Coach. Mm-hmm. So transitioning from player to coach, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then 2022, Coach of the Year. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Assistant Coach now of the EPU. Yep. Mum to Ollie. Yep. And overall, all right, last. Overall, all right, last. <laughs> I, I love that, that kid, <laughs> You've missed a few, but I'll let you off. All right. Oh, go on. I'm, not <laughs> no, I'm joking. Fair, looking at that, you've got a good record for a CV there. Like, some good accomplishments. It's not bad, is it? It's not bad. It's, no. it's not bad. Yeah, that is my CV. You've probably done it better than what I could have done. Yeah, I've got a lot to thank for rugby and enjoyed every step of the journey. And I still think I've got a lot lot to achieve. Good, good times playing at Bradford, Leeds, England. And, um, could have been more proud being the first captain of the club and... The first player that I signed and been part of forming the Rhinos and been on that journey ever since. It were um, it was and still is class. Yeah, 100%. So amongst being a world-class player, um, Thanks, you're Kevin. now a mum. I am a mum. So I am a mum. Beautiful Ollie. He is beautiful. How old is he? He'll be two in April. Two in April, yeah. yeah. Do you mind telling us a bit more about motherhood? <laughs> Motherhood, oh, um, I said to someone on the phone this morning, it's um, getting out of the house again. So child minds is like an Olympic sport <laughs> for the morning. You know, you've done a few school runs. Not, She's not got a baby, but she's a uh, top auntie. Always knew I wanted kids. Um, and obviously with what happened in my career in injury and stuff like that and um, COVID, sped that process up a little bit. I thought about what I wanted out of life and it seemed like a good time to um, have a child. I think I realised there's never a perfect time because... Mm-hmm. I think as a woman, you're all, well, I'm quite career focused and things like that. There's never going to be a time where you go, right, that, that's perfect. I think you always know it's going to be chaos. And um, yeah, so Mark, Mark on board and just, yeah, we, we decided to start a family and it's it's best thing I've I've done. It, it's brilliant, but it's it's challenging and it's it's just the best thing you'll do. That's all I'd say. He's good. So, and I like the fact that, um, he arrived on the, the the weekend of Super League 2021. <laughs> we all knew that was going to happen. So it was team run Thursday and everyone were like, why are you here? And I'm like, because <laughs> playing Featherstone on Sunday. And then he arrived on Friday. That's the reason he came. Oh, Just no. a bit of, <laughs> bit of training got us moving. Yeah, no one let me drive to training. My mum made me get a lift and then Mark had to pick me up because everyone was like, you shouldn't be driving. Why? What was labour like? Was it like the worst pain ever? <laughs> it was horrendous, but people know I'm a bit weird. I actually quite like the fact that it was... Like a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm a like, Yeah. I'm the person ever, so. Thanks. Um, but no, it was, it was hard. It was back to back and it was horrendous. And yeah, it was funny. It was very <laughs> it was funny. funny. Kira's asking this because she's getting brooded. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I like, you do it tomorrow. This is a thing when my mum, I actually remember saying to the midwife, you were all lying. <laughs> you would not do this again tomorrow. Because I was thinking this. <laughs> but then when the baby's here, you're just like, do it again tomorrow. But yeah, it was uh, it was funny. I remember my first couple of sessions coming back because I came back quite early to see you a lot. Obviously, don't like to uh, miss out on training. And I remember thinking like, oh, I really walked up and down the pitch and thinking, I'm not, not quite ready to be fully back yet. <laughs> and then obviously came back, first game, got COVID and we lost in the semi-final. So it was uh, all fun and games, wasn't it? <laughs> we can't talk about that. <laughs> no, but yeah. um, especially now, me and Kira were at an England session not long ago and they were talking about the, the help that you get from the England programme now in terms of after the World Cup, they heard a few people were interested in having kids and that they'll give the support to them whilst they're recovering and whilst they're wanting to get back to playing rugby. So I think that's the best thing that the sport can do at the moment with women, especially at the, the highest level. Yeah, massively. I think it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a choice and that's what we're pushing with the EPU and at Leeds is it's not a choice to 
have kids or be a sportswoman, it's I'll have kids kids and still be a sportswoman. You know, it's it's hard it's tough to get back to what you were doing before, but I reckon if I weren't injured I still definitely could. And we've seen people like in the World Cup like Sammy Bremner, we've got people in the women's super league who have done it as well over here. So um it shouldn't be a choice. You should feel supported, you should feel empowered. And actually I think that being around you lot, as in Lee as women, makes me a better person. It makes me a better mum. Having a drive and a goal away from being a mum to Ollie is, is good for him, good for me. And I hope one day I'll look back and, and be proud. What about your support network at home, like with Ollie and then balancing everything else? It takes a team, doesn't it? So obviously I, I work full time as well. So there's, there's Mark, um, who's brilliant. He obviously does training nights while I'm here and everywhere. And then he plays football Saturday. I do rugby Sunday. So um, it's a nice balance. Um, I'll probably say that's why we're still together because you don't see that much of each other. <laughs> and obviously, grandparents so on his side and my side it's just um everyone everyone looks in and my brother if my brother don't get a shout out now I'll be absolutely <laughs> brother and Katrina so yeah I know I've got a lot of people who um are really supportive and it does you know it can't just be all on you because um I can't be everywhere at once and um yeah it, it's good everyone's really really supportive and, and you need that. As you mentioned there uh, about previously having Ollie because of the stint with your injury yeah, yeah. do you mind talking about what happened? <laughs> No, no, I don't. I don't. I, t I don't tend to talk about it much because it's. Um, it's. I don't. They want to reflect on it, and people like be on down about it. It's. It's tough one. So obviously, I signed for Leeds in twenty seventeen after the World Cup. So tw it was twenty eighteen. So I finished World Cup in twenty seventeen. Went to Australia. Played for England. Came back from the World Cup. Would sign for Leeds. Everyone knew that was happening, and it was quite an interesting time because. People were all always saying, oh, Leeds shouldn't launch yet. They're not going to be able to... It, it, it was quite um, a taboo sub subject, I guess. And obviously our first signing, I remember the first game, I watched a bit about the other day, actually, when we played Bradford at Oddsall. Um, class. Yeah. The young Beavers coming on off at bench, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, Shah Boone got injured in the first half. Yeah. So when you're going full back, I went, I'm, I'm what? <laughs> yeah, so it was, um, it was class. We obviously signed, played in 2018, and then it were, we, we played, we won that opening game against Bradford, one of the best games I've played in. Just uh, Judas. Uh, Judas. <laughs> yeah. I took Amy Arcastle's head off, I think, yeah. and I got absolutely, I didn't mean to, by the way, I was just, it were covered, it were make or break, and I, I did it, and yeah. you know, that's what you got to do. And she's fine, I'm fine. No, no, me, no love lost. But the fans were not fine, they were shouting no. Judas at me. Um, <laughs> And then I think Shona, Shona and Amy the week after, what does Judas mean at oh. England training? I'm like, really? Um, yeah, that's the first time we knew that we'd made it, Leanne, because I got a death threat after that game. I saw it after on social media, I have to report it to Leanne. Played in 2018, then we got to, we, we won the um, Challenge Cup over in Warrington against Cass. Um, we won the league leaders. And then we we're playing against St. Ellen's on the 9th of September, 2018, because it's day before, day before my dad's birthday. That's the only reason oh, I remember right, it. Okay. I'm not good with dates. <laughs> um, and yeah, I just jumped out of my half in like the 85th minute. And I just, I think people thought I'd been hit because it was a high shot, but it was as I fell down. I just, ACL went. Um, like anyone else, it's fine, is what it is. We'll get back to it. We've seen a load of players who've done it. Um, but then I went for my surgery um, late that year. and. Three months after things weren't going right, it were January 30th or 31st of January, I don't know when, going and getting an MRI done because things weren't getting back to normal. And then I remember getting a phone call that night from the club doctor saying, oh, the surgeon wants to see you. And I thought, this is weird, that's a bit quick. So I had the MRI on like Wednesday, say, and then I got a phone call the Wednesday night um, saying he wants to see you tomorrow. And then text me as well. So I put, I'm like, yeah, fine, fine. Then text me saying, and also, can you make sure you don't have to eat tonight? And I'm like, what? So now we're Googling yeah. and eating cereal because I just bought a nice bag of cereal that I really wanted. <laughs> so it was um, special K, like crunchy granola. Like it was like in a bag, it's usually like three, four pounds, <laughs> one pound fifty. So like, I'm of course, buying you. <laughs> exactly. You know. Yeah. And um, so I wanted it. So I had that at about 12 o'clock Googling, why does my surgeon want to see me and not eat? <laughs> and I knew that the probably, well, I didn't actually think, I think I'm very one of them, like until something bad happens, I don't believe it. So I just saw, if the worst comes to worst, he's going to take my graft out, but that's not going to happen. That's a bit, like, surreal. That's just not going to happen. And then I went in expecting to go for a blood test, and then he just he looked at me like the Grim Reaper, and he went, do you know the bad news or the bad news? I was like, what? Well, OK. And he was like, I'm going to have to take your graft out. You've got an infection in your, in your femur um, called osteomyelitis. I'm going to have to take your graft out, and um, the bad news is we're doing it now. And I'm like, what? I'm, I'm parked over there. <laughs> so I got a parking ticket. 
surgery yeah. and stayed in, yeah. So I had to come back and get my car. But yeah, so I got osteomyelitis in my, in my femur, which is a bone infection. It was quite, like, quite big. So I had, to think, three operations. Stayed in for eight days the first time. I had three operations. I had a pick line in my arm for antibiotics to go in via my bloodstream because it would get to my leg quicker. Um, went home and the infection won't go in, so it ended up in again. I had another two oper... There was another three... Op yeah, there was no two operations. Came home again, had the had the pick line with the antibiotic and started to get back to looking at getting back playing. But then from the extent of the damage, they went back in, in I think, um, July 2019. They went back in just to make sure everything had cleared up and it had. And then that were when the decisions on the back of that. So that were probably a good, like a good year um, of, of that happening. And then on the back of that, it was conversations about what getting back to rugby looked like. And it wouldn't have been straightforward because I'd taken so much of my bone away. I'd have had to have a bone graft, but I wouldn't have had enough bone from my hip to put in there. So I'd have had a bone donor, and then that increases the risk of reinfection. And then having another infection means that if you had to scrape my thigh anymore, I'd break my femur. And it, it'd be, the surgeon's words, it'd be quite catastrophic. And it's, it, it's you know, it, it's not guaranteed to work. And all that that they'd have done, it'd have taken um, between 18 months and two years. And at that point, that would have been past the World Cup. Yeah. So he didn't really want to operate on me. I had decisions to make. My my knees are already pretty. Um, I don't know a better word than saying knackered. Um, in terms of like having osteoarthritis and stuff like that from the operations I've had. So I made the decision that I wouldn't get back in the timeline that I wanted to. It wasn't guaranteed to work. I, my, my health had already taken quite a, a battering. If it went wrong, it would go really wrong, and I don't know what that would end up looking like. So yeah, I ended up deciding that the best thing probably to, to hang up hang up my boots didn't really feel like I had a choice which made it a little bit easier but yeah so I hung my boots up in, in 2019 and that's always why my, that's my favourite photo of there's one of me hugging Courtney and one of me with Shabu walking off on 2019 because I was so proud of you of, of us and what we'd achieved in that grand final but I knew that I were retiring and I could, I had not I knew that week but I'd not told anyone obviously because I didn't want to be a downer on the party but I knew and it was just weird that I knew no one else knew and I'm on this pitch and I felt so alone yet so like looked after yeah. and that's where I think for me it shines through in, in team sport that even though it were really tough everything that happened I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done it any other way and I wouldn't have done it with any other people because I think that look back on different times like Courtney bringing in the bloody captain's hat in the uh, in box, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, still got a photo of it. Yeah, you were done. And like going through it with Madison, Madison in rehab club and, and didn't get selected for the final. And just, I think actually, I'm really fortunate in a way now as a coach. Obviously, I wouldn't have been a coach just yet, but as a coach now, I think that it's actually shaped and will hopefully make me a better coach from everything that I experienced as a player, I think, and hope. So, moving on in terms of transitioning from a player to a coach, how did you find that? Like, who was your me mentor? <laughs> It's really, it was really hard. Um, I think the early conversations I had were with um, Cuthbo, Kevin Sinfield and Ben Jones in terms of what their vision was for them in terms of me taking over and I felt really supported by those conversations. Um, and then coming into, into the role, Ant and Dave Gibbons, <laughs> it's the best out there. Like, couldn't have done it with, with two better blokes by my side and wouldn't, cho wouldn't choose to. I don't actually think we would have been as successful as we have been without them. They're absolutely class. So they were amazing mentors, and then Leon, obviously, he's he's been he's been classy. Obviously, we're there. We started the women's team together in terms of like the, the strategy behind it and the just the groundwork. He coached before I coached, and he always said that if I ever needed, it, he'd, he'd drop back in. And I don't think he realised he'd come back in as an assistant <laughs> coach, but I can be persuasive, it seems. And then Stu Barrow as well, checking in with him regularly and and doing my level three. Rich Tunningley, he was brilliant. Chev Rowan. Uh, Barry Eaton so many like, so there's so many and it's not just one person I think that for me as a coach I don't always have to know all the answers but I need to be willing to look for them and to put a lot of time into making sure I get the right answers for us as a group and I don't always have to have the answer but I, I will find it and then share it with us all and, and get there and I think that I'm really lucky that there's so many people around me who, who can help with that. It's like a unique situation in terms of like the players who you played with you're now coaching so how did you find like doing that dealing with that? Yeah and I think when we did our Y-Box I spoke at the Rhino I, I, I thought about what to say and I, I spoke a little bit around, around my injury and it, not a lot because I, I just don't like speaking about me and that because uh, I don't want it to be I just don't, I don't know, I don't like it. But one, I wanted the girls to know that obviously I had played with a lot of you and that's why I don't play with you now is because of that injury. But also know that I did play with you because 
we have got a unique situation. Like I have played with both of you. I have, you know, taught you, uh, coached you at Brov, seen you on development days. Like I can't change the pathway that we've all been on. And then like, I wouldn't they'd be like, all right, I'm head coach now. Can't talk to you. Don't, <laughs> don't, have any, don't, have any, don't have any banter with me. Like it doesn't work like that. So it's important that everyone knows that it is a unique situation of different relation, relationships, different personalities. And when I thought about taking over from Cuthbert when he, when he offered me that, that opportunity and the club offered me that opportunity I just figured that the only thing I can be is honest because can't change all the different different scenarios that there are and how, how we all know each other different relationships you have but if I'm honest with everyone and stick to that then we should we should be all right so open and honest is, is the only way and I'll always do the right thing for the team and at times it's been difficult I'm sure you've seen some tough conversations that I've had to have and yeah they're hard at the time but I think that all the girls know that I'll do what is right for them the team and, and and the collective so it's yeah it's tough at times but I think it's actually the, the it's it's the best best thing I don't think we'll ever get something like this again because it's it's pretty special and like you say it is unique and I like it and I'm, I, don't, I think it must be working all right for us all so far so yeah long long may it continue is it something you're still getting used to then in terms of telling people that you played alongside or played against um, what you want out of them and the things that they need to improve on? I think I'd always ask. I don't think I'd try to tell like tell you as much. I'd always, it's always a two-way street and I'd be asking you and you could equally tell me if I'm not helping you get there, yeah. like what more you need. It's, we're going to get there together. I think we need to do this. What do you think? And I think that hopefully you all get that, that as players, but um, yeah, it, it, I, I wouldn't say it's tough because I think we've got a really, really good group. I don't think anyone, like I think I'm incredibly lucky of the group of girls that we've got and as a coaching group we are because I, I think that you are pretty chill, grounded, humble and and committed and, and want to work hard and that's that's the foundations and I think that, you know, we'll always have a chat and if, if I said to you, I, I'd love to see more of this from you and, and I think this is how we do it and you go, but... I think that we don't do enough of this and I need more of that. And we'd go, right, okay. Yeah. And we'd take it on board and, and that's what we'd look at together. But yeah, I think I'd never I hope I hope you all think that I'm not a teller <laughs> and I'm not a dictator. But um yeah, kind of give you a, a freedom um and a chance to express yourself and be creative, but be quite clear on what we what we're looking for and what's gonna make you better and what's gonna make us better. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. And like in terms of pressure and stuff, obviously <clears throat> you're not in control on like game days. You think I like being in control, Kira? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, like so when you put a thirteen out, and yeah. when you when you're a player, like you are the ones who get the outcome. So, how do you find being like on the sideline making the decision, but not actually controlling the outcome? <laughs> it, it's definitely a learning curve, <laughs> and I'm getting more com comfortable with it. Um, comfortable being uncomfortable yeah. um, it's obviously hard like as a and I think actually pregnancy are a good thing I remember Stu Barrow and, and Richard Nunley saying to me it's probably a good thing that you're pregnant because there was a time where I couldn't demo stuff and actually yeah. demoing stuff doesn't always make you a good coach so like thinking about different ways of getting my, my message across and what's the best way for you to to learn something is it for you seeing it visually from a coach demoing a different player demoing from video of you doing it yeah. um, and things like that so it's hard not being a player because as a player, I just knew what I was doing and I could do it. Like, I think I got my role pretty well and I just knew what I was doing and I got to a point in my career where I was established and it was like my bread and butter. And then coming as a coach, I've got to then look at all different positions, think about all different things. Um, and yeah, it's tough and it's definitely a learning curve and it's a learning curve for all of us. And, and that's probably the message that we had last year, obviously. I think where we've, we've struggled in the, grand uh, the Challenge Cup final, I think we could have won that game if we were fitter and not used our interchanges better but obviously went down from 10 to 8 interchanges and I just don't think we'd got the rotations right but I don't think it was necessarily just a coaching thing that we didn't get right it was the girls recognising that we need them to play for longer at a higher intensity to be able to get the rotations right so I think that fitness and, and, and getting our rotation rotations of our pack right is where we, we came short a little bit and, and just missed a few chances don't get me wrong we missed a few chances but that were a big learning curve. But yeah, I, I've i become more comfortable with, with being not in control. Mm -hmm. And the big thing that I recognise is there's no right. I'm very black or white. I'm like, it's that or that. Yeah. And I, as a coach, I've been like, yeah, it's always there. Yeah. There's no, like, one half fits all. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, it's be, be comfortable being in the grey area. 
<laughs> what are the feelings like on a game day then? Because obviously, no matter who I'm playing, I'll be absolutely babbing myself. Yeah. How do you go from the transition to playing nerves to coaching nerves? Is there much of a difference? Yeah, it's massive a difference because, yeah, when you're a player, you're always like pump full of adrenaline, like just ready to carry, ready yeah. to tackle, and you, you're there and you know there's something you can do early doors. For me, as a person and as a coach, I've just got, I'm just stay chill all the time and hopefully I come across as that to you a lot. Um, just try to be, to be relaxed and recognise that you feed off every emotion that I give you. Mm. So it'll never be chill to the point of being like monotone because I'm, I think I'm quite a bubbly, upbeat person, but um, it's me making sure that I don't get you too up or too down or too chill. It's how my, my personality comes across on you guys. So yeah, I think I actually feel relaxed because yeah. um, I back you girls to go out there and do, do a good job and it's like even at half times I don't, I don't ever really feel like yeah, panicked or anything I think it's just it's let's just get some key things across to get us there but I get excited I get animated I get you've seen the footage back girls <laughs> <laughs> when you're scoring, she's screaming and ugly. Oh, no. It's brilliant. Yeah. What was so Sophie Roberts? Uh, I, I just a bit when Sophie Roberts scored, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> with the bloody microphone in my hand, and then they try talking to me, and I'm giving Gibbo my bloody notepad, and then try to do interchanges and try to talk to them. But yeah, I um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm excited, I'm animated, but I think um, yeah, I'm, I'm just me. I I, I am quite um competitive and I'd never know. yeah I'd, I'd like, <laughs> like to win and if we're not I'll find a way out but yeah I'm animated but I think that when I come down from the stand and I'm in the changing room so hopefully it's it's more relaxed and I recognise that you guys feed off of what I present so it's important yeah so finally like the development of the game you've been around for a bit now I guess. what do you mean Kira? So it has come a long way in olden times yeah. <laughs> so what do you think's next it has come a long way and how good how, how good has the growth been from where you two have come I think you guys are the first benefactors of it and we spoke about when we had Lisa McIntosh in to present our jerseys you've got to stand on the shoulders of the others before us and and when you look at what, what they did and then I thought I were lucky that I went and played in New Zealand and I played in Australia and stuff like that and then you guys have gone to Papua New Guinea and then you've gone to World Nines and you've gone to a World Cup on home soil just like and then playing in Women's Super League, you, you're playing at, at Headingley. I only ever got to play when the South Stand were getting knocked down and you walk out in front of the stand, the, in front of the crowd in the South Stand and it's it's massive and that's been important for the game because if you can see it, you can be it. Yeah. And the young girls who are inspired by all of our players, all the players in the Women's Super League and, you know, they'll still take some inspiration from the players who've been before, whether that's in a coaching role or a media role or, you know, hearing stories about the likes of Lisa McIntosh and, and Brenda Dobeck. Um, it's massive and we've just got to keep keep doing that because ultimately the end goal is for us to have the, the, a big player pool, to have an elite top level, which we're, we're getting there with, and for the game to be broadcastable Full time, you know, it can be on every week, not three times a year. And then that brings in revenue and then from the revenue becomes full time contracts and things like that. But we've just got to recognise that that's a slow burner and Rome won't built in a day. And actually just enjoy the journey we're on and enjoy where we are right now. I think the more you get, the more you want. That's human nature. And I remember I read some of one of the Sydney, I think it was one of the uh, South Sydney players put out, or Sydney News, I can't remember. But just focus on being a winner focus on being competitive and when you f think about being a winner the other stuff becomes less important and I think just make the game the best it can be at this top level if you're in development get as many little wins as you can more girls playing more girls enjoying if they're not playing are they officiating are they watching you lot what are they doing um, are they coaching um, and the more people get involved in the game the more it'll grow and the more it grows um, the bigger it comes at the top and then the bigger it is at the top and more we can get money in and, and then look after the players that are involved but I think that you just got to enjoy where we're at now and recognise it's um, we're taking time but we'll get there and it's good we'd have thought that a kid from Brov and a kid from Burstle would be we sat here <laughs> on their own podcast I know <laughs> real baby Especially from the three of us, as you mentioned there, we've come through the uh, hometown clubs playing for the lads' teams. And now I went to the tournament not so long ago and they had like an under eight girls' team. Yeah. The fact that they're starting at such a young age now, I think, is a massive step for the Women's Super League to just get bigger and bigger. So the numbers of participation rates are just going through the roof. 
Uh, I'm sure you're seeing that at a work point of view. Yeah, massively. And I think even just getting involved at that level, because when you get involved at that level, you don't know where it's going to take you. Like, I was just a kid who a coach said to me, do you want to join in at East Leeds because my brother were there? And I've joined in and from picking up that ball, I'm sat here on a, a prime time podcast. <laughs> I've, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm head coach lead right now. I was like, what? That's my, that's my part of my job. Do you know what I mean? Like, pinch yourself. I, I don't know. Um, coaching with England, development office for Leeds Rhinos Foundation. I've, I've travelled like you to have with the game. I've been to countries I've never been to. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to Brazil or New Zealand or Australia. I've been to university, like my, my, no one in my family have been to university, but sport gave me the confidence to feel like I know who I am, I know what I can achieve, I'm confident in me, I'm going to go to uni. Those girls just need to pick up the ball because you don't know where it takes you. Look at other players we've got in our team, like Shannon Lacey would quite openly probably say she wouldn't have gone to Papua New Guinea. Mm. She wouldn't, you know, she'd been playing for Leeds Rhinos if, if rugby hadn't given her the confidence. Would she be a teacher? It gives people much more than just what you probably see. And I think that... That, that's the biggest thing that when you when you pick up the ball, it's it's about much more than that, and and girls should be empowered by sports. So yeah, there's so many more girls playing. I think what you're saying about the under eight stuff is what we want to tap into at the foundation. We want to give girls who are seven to ten more opportunity to play because and play for a girls only team because some girls like yourself will go and mix it up with boys and be better and mm -hmm. give them it. And ultimately, some girls will be less confident, and we don't want to lose them to the game. We want to give them time to mature and flourish in that environment and. And, and stay in the game and uh, and push on, but yeah, it's it's certainly exciting. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think that is a wrap. So Thanks. thank you very much for being part of the first. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> Loved it. Thanks. It's all right. Well done, you two. Thank you very much. Smashed it. <laughs>